There we go. Welcome back. How's everyone doing today? Good. We're, th we're thrilled you're here. My name is Cecilia McGargy, and I work in the Lifetime Learning Department in the Office of Engagement. And on behalf of Lifetime Learning and the Alumni Association, I want to thank you for coming today and joining us for this great lecture with Coy and his panel. A couple of things initially, please silence your phones right away should be great. And you see some feedback cards, the green cards. At the end of the program, if you could take the time to fill those out, that would be great. Additionally, when we get to the Q&A portion, if you don't mind waiting till I get over to you, myself or Dana will come by with a uh, microphone. We, we are podcasting, so having a question into the mic would be helpful. OK, let's get started. Um, I would like to introduce Corey Barefoot. Coy is an award-winning, best-selling author, media personality, an engaging historian and teacher, as well as an Ironman triathlete. Coy's books include Thomas Jefferson on Leadership, Executive Lessons from His Life and Letters, and The Corner, A History of Student Life at the University of Virginia, which won the 2003, how do you say it, Coy? Nall. Nall, sorry. Uh, Nall Prize for Outstanding History. He has written and reported for magazines and newspapers around the country, as well as a long list of online publications. Coy is the president and executive director of the Virginia History Lab. The mission of the Virginia History Lab is to find and share those engaging stories that bring the past to life, that teach, and that inspire. Coy is the founding host and executive producer of Inside Charlottesville, which is, a broad, which is broadcast as a television program and a radio program. He is a member of the adjunct faculty at the University of Virginia, where he teaches classes about the life of Thomas Jefferson, the history of the university, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the early American Republic. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Corey Barefoot. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. Happy Friday. Happy reunions. My, uh, let me just start with my apologies that the pool hall has closed at the corner. I know you all wanted to, that's where you all wanted to go first before you started anything, was go have a few, uh, a few rounds there at the pool hall, make a few bets. Um, it's been a long time since that was open, but I know there are a lot of memories in this room of the corner and the pool hall, the Virginian. There's some in this room who remember the Cavalier, I am sure, both Cavaliers. Um, yeah, and Poe's uh, in the 70s. So um, just really quickly, a little plug. I'm speaking again tomorrow morning uh, doing a talk just about an hour about the founding of the university. And you, that's in the program. You can, uh, you can find it there, when and where. Please join me tomorrow morning if you want. It'll be right after President Sullivan's remarks on the lawn. And I'll be talking really in depth, behind the scenes, looking at the letters, the real story about the founding of the university, which um, most people, even in this room, have, have never heard of. You've never really heard what really happened. The politics, the intrigue, the money. Um, it's a fascinating story. And it is truly amazing that it happened. Because they threw every roadblock at that guy that you can imagine. Made him jump through every hoop. It was, it was just staggering. So I'll be doing that tomorrow morning. And, uh, and look forward to seeing you again there. What we're going to do today is... It's, as the program says, this is about the, the past, the present, and the future of honor at Virginia. And we specifically said honor at Virginia and not honor system at Virginia, because we all know those are two different things. And um, I want to begin by just saying that the seed for this discussion was planted in Jefferson's own letters, when he very specifically said the mission of the University of Virginia and he said, the purpose of any university, it should be an incubator where students are taught science and virtue, what we would call knowledge and character. And, and he really believed that the communication, the inspiration, the lessons of character, of virtue, of honor, should be a part of this experience. It shouldn't just be music, literature, the arts, science. It really should have something to do. Your experience here should have something to do. If everything's working right, it should have something to do with improving your character as a human being who lives in a society with other human beings, as a citizen. So that's the, that's the deep prologue for this conversation about the past, present, and future of honor at Virginia. And I'm going to open it up to the panelists 
in just a few minutes, but I want to give you a quick sketch to get us started. Just a few minutes, a quick sketch of the evolution of honor at Virginia, because it didn't just come out of the box as the honor system in 1842. What happened in 1842 on July 4th is the new law professor made a suggestion in a, in a faculty meeting that perhaps we should have the students sign a pledge to their tests that they didn't cheat. That's where this starts, July 4th, 1842. Contrary to magnificent student lore, it had nothing to do with the murder of a professor. It's a great story. We can go into that another time. Perhaps some of you have heard me tell that story. It didn't have anything to do with the murder of a professor two years before. It had everything to do with the fact, you can see it in the notes, in the faculty minutes, that they were grappling with how to curb student cheating. They were having an issue. And this was an idea that just came up. Hey, you know, other schools do this. Maybe we could have the students sign a pledge affirming on their honor they, that they didn't cheat. It's a fantastic idea. 1842, the honor pledge is born. And originally, folks, that's all it is. It's a pledge in the classroom. It had nothing to do with stealing. Uh, it had everything to do with, I didn't cheat on this test. And that's all it was. And it was created by the faculty. The first honor trial in 1853, I think, against a medical student um, was all faculty driven. It was not about the students didn't create this. But what the students did create is the code. And that was after the Civil War. And again, we won't go into this long story. It has to do with the lost cause. It has to do with veterans of the Civil War returning to the school with a sense of Southern pride and Southern honor. And they used that old pledge from a few decades before, which was still in use, of course. They used that to create a code that would inform their relationships with one another outside the classroom. And so you start to see in the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s, you start to see talk about a code, about a pledge becoming a code. And that is about lying, cheating, and stealing. That's about, hey, if you are going to be a member of this community, we are going to hold you to a higher standard. And we are going to call you forth to join us on this ground of honor and we invite you to be with us. Then in the 19-teens, roughly 1912, 1913, there is talk about a system. And the system was born because they created for the first time a standing committee. And they referred to it as the Honor Committee, which really hadn't existed until then. It was sort of an ad hoc thing. It was sort of put together by the presidents of the schools. Now they're going to create a standalone committee to oversee the enforcement and the participation of the code that had been based on the old pledge. So the evolution of honor at Virginia, which really goes, starts in 1842, post-Civil War, into the 20th century, is from pledge to code to system. And immediately, the system ran into objections from alumni Hey, we didn't have an honor committee when I was there. Why do you need that? Why can't everyone, the entire student body, is the committee to enforce the code? Why do we have this new bureaucracy? And it got a lot of criticism from alumni in the 19-teens who didn't support this new system, who said this is just going to... And the objections at the time were this. This invites bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy will kill the spirit of the code. And there are some, I'm sure, in this room who would say that's exactly what's happened. And that is perhaps one of the greatest challenges of the honor system. But the system evolved, as we all know, it grew and grew and grew. It did become more bureaucratic as it had to handle some of the challenges of its own time. And every generation has had to figure out, OK, how do we make this system work so that the code is alive and well. The code, the system was created to preserve and strengthen the code. It's very American if you think about it. We create government to preserve and strengthen human liberties. And the fear and the challenge is that the bureaucracy 
will get in the way and crush and destroy the thing it was created to protect. And that, we certainly see that with the honor system at Virginia. So that's a quick sketch of the evolution and where we are today, pledge to code to system. And what I want to do now is open this up to our panel and hear them weigh in as we try to connect the dots today with, with your participation between this past, the present, where we are now, and the future of honor at Virginia. And when I say the future of honor, I mean two things. I mean the future of this system and the future of honor that the system was created to, to preserve and to strengthen. That idea, that Jeffersonian idea that this experience that we have here in this community will have as much to do with character and virtue as it will with your studies in the classroom. So the panel that we put together here, and, and I should say we had some other participants who had to back out, this panel was much more diverse originally than it looks now, I promise. <laughs> but we had some folks who, who couldn't make it today, so uh, we'll get to talk to them with an, another time. Uh, Michael Lennox in the middle is a professor of Darden, and you can find fuller bios online. I'm just going to do quick introductions. Michael was an honor chair in 1992, and he now serves on the Honor Audit Commission, which I would wager there's a few of you in the room who didn't even know that existed. There is a commission that has been appointed to audit the honor system, to figure out what do we do in the 21st century? How can we help as a community with the goals of this committee. What can we all do to pitch in and make it work better? So we're gonna hear from Michael about that. Stuart Ackerley is Associate Counsel at Williams and Connolly in Washington, and he was Vice Chair of Trials in 2006, and he was a student member of the Board of Visitors in 2011. Charlie Harris is Associate at Hunt and Williams, and he was Honor Chair in 2011. And um, I'm just gonna start We'll start with you, Stuart, and just work down the row here. Your thoughts as you're coming to Charlottesville, and you're going to speak in Charlottesville about honor and your experiences, what has crossed your mind? What do you want to leave with these people today? I think for me, my view of the honor system and honor at Virginia is always um, shaded by the past and my experience at UVA. My dad was a 65 graduate of the college, and he was chairman of the honor committee when he was at UVA. So when I came and matriculated to UVA, I had a, a very strong sense from him of what honor meant and that the honor system was very important at UVA. But over my now seven years at UVA as a student, I also realized that the university in 2006 and 2011 was a very different place than it was when my dad was a student in 1965. Uh, I think in most ways, those changes were for the better. And, and but one of the things that didn't change was that what honor meant at UVA was still the same. It was about certain values and teaching certain values to students, primarily integrity, responsibility, and taking responsibility for your own actions and of those around you. And also of respect, respecting your fellow students so you don't cheat or steal from them or lie to them respecting professors and not cheating on the tests that they give you, respecting community members. What's changed is how we've kind of operationalized the honor system, as Coy talked about in his introduction, and it's gone from you know, a system where it was just the presidents of the college oversaw the honor system to now you have, gosh, probably almost 30 elected representatives from all the different schools, You've got 100 plus students who work as support officers to help administer the system. But at its core, it's still the same. It's about those you know, key values of integrity, responsibility, and respect. Um, and that's, for me, what I always think about when I think about honor at UVA. So uh, w when they announced the title for this, and it was past, present, future, and then I'm looking across the panel, I, I fear that I think I'm the past on the, uh, <laughs> on the panel here. Um, I've got my 25th reunion coming up uh, next year. Um, I have a, a unique perspective in being both an alumni of the university and someone who was involved with the honor system while I was an undergraduate here, but also as a faculty member. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is maybe put a, a bigger picture on honor and integrity at universities, and, and in particular here at UVA. 
Uh, if you're not aware, there, there is an epidemic of academic fraud and cheating amongst universities across this country. Uh, recent surveys have suggested upwards of 90% of students self-admit to cheating at some point during college. Now put that in perspective, there have been surveys done, anonymous surveys done at the UVA that suggest around 10% admit to that. Now I think none of us would be happy with 10%, um, but there's a huge difference here than other places. Uh, I'm an economist, I can tell you, despite what you might think about the methodologies there, there's a, most likely a significant difference between 90% and 10% when looking at UVA. So uh, I joined UVA's faculty in, in 2008. So I, I had the benefit of like my wife and I, so my wife's also a UVA undergrad a graduate, um, of wandering in the darkness for 15 years before finding my way back here to Charlottesville. And we're so thankful to have had that opportunity to come back. But it also gave me uh, the privilege of, of seeing other institutions. Uh, I did my graduate work up at MIT. My wife worked at Harvard. I actually served as a dorm parent there. We moved down to Princeton. We spent time at NYU. I spent six years on the faculty at Duke. So I've seen a number of our peer institutions and the environment there. And it really gave me a fine appreciation for the unique attributes that UVA has and the unique culture and environment we have surrounding the honor system. To give you just some perspective of how this works at other schools, and I'm going to pick on some of these, and I'm sorry if some of you maybe are graduates of these other places. Uh, at MIT, it was very dysfunctional uh, to the point that there was almost an uh, anonymity between the students and the administration and faculty. And so cheating there was a sport. It was a sport celebrated by the other students. How clever could you be in getting away with cheating? You, you took it to the man. You, you were able to like, you know, find a way to get around the bureaucracy, the administration, and faculty. Could you imagine that here, that attitude? Uh, at Harvard, there was very much the kind of the star chamber model, I would say, where their system, and they do have a system, is run by the administration. Uh, if you are found you know, by a faculty to be suspected of cheating, you are called in to a panel of faculty and administrators who right then and there adjudicate, and they make their decision. Now, from an efficiency standpoint, I'm sure all of us could realize, like, wow, that would be quick and easy. But from, again, from a perspective of where the students are engaging and how they view honor and cheating, completely different than what we have here. I I've long come and I've long felt and respected the idea that I think what is most unique and most powerful about UVA's honor system is actually the student self-governance piece. This notion that it is a promise by the students to one another and to the community, including me now as a faculty member, that they're going to hold themselves to a higher standard is very unique. Just a handful of schools across the country have that perspective on honor and academic integrity. And so I think we can get into the details about changes in the systems and the like, but as long as we hold true to that ideal, that this is a promise from the students to one another and to the community, we're very strong as an honor system. As I drove here from Richmond, uh, I, I kind of had two, two trains of thought. Um, one, very optimistic and positive, and that's been what I think probably everyone in this room has taken away from the honor system, which is a strong sense of integrity and responsibility for one's own actions. And that plays out in your careers and your personal lives and is something that I think is distinctive about UVA uh, in that so many people walk away from this institution holding those values so close to their heart. Uh, and then the other train of thought was back to my time in the trenches uh, of the Honor Committee and reading about the folks who are in the trenches today and last year and the year before. Uh, and that's one that is a little more frustrating. You know, and I'm sure folks hear, hear the news about cases where students are acquitted when it seems clear they've cheated or um, you know, the process seems incredibly unwieldy and, uh, you know, a report from a professor that there was cheating on an exam isn't resolved for over a year. Uh, or, you know, folks may be frustrated with, with the changes to the sanction system and things like that. And those, I think, are all legitimate concerns um, and ones that, you know, I'm not in the driver's seat anymore, so they're not mine to solve, but I think are ones that we're still grappling with and understanding how in such a big, diverse school with so many different stakeholders in this system, uh, you solve them. And I, you know, I'm interested to hear from Mike more about the Honor Audit Commission and what some of their thoughts are as to the future of the system. Um, you know, I would volunteer that I think it's become incredibly bureaucratic. Uh, and I was the Honor Chair as a law student, uh, and it's very enticing when you have the opportunity to affect change to build bigger systems and build more complex systems 
And you know, there are good reasons for complex layered systems. Uh, it keeps the students who are in the hot seat safe. Um, you know, due process is a key piece of the American ideal. Um, but there's a time where I think systems need to look inward and say, have, are we laboring under too much of our own weight? And um, that's one piece that's frustrating to me. But to end on a positive note, again, uh, I think those are independent from the spirit of the University of Virginia and the spirit of the honor system. Uh, and that is something that, you know, I would say at least once a week I have an opportunity in my professional, personal life where I make a decision and I think about UVA and I think about the honor system. And sometimes they're big ones. Um, and it has been kind of a beacon for me and I'm sure for many others in this room and, and many, many more outside of it. Uh, so despite one avenue of, of perhaps frustration, there's still, I think, in the most important piece of it is this pervading spirit among such a group of talented and you know, dispersed individuals across this country and the world. So those are my two thoughts driving uh, up 64 this morning. Let me ask you, and we're going to go to questions in just a few minutes because we definitely want to hear from you, but I want to ask you each to, to respond to an idea that it wasn't long ago, and I can't remember the exact year, or four or five, or it could have been a few years before that. There was a survey of students at Virginia that said, of those of you who know of an honor offense, you absolutely knew one occurred, how many of you reported it? How many of you started the process? You, you used the honor committee. It's, it's there for a purpose, and you took use of that to uphold that standard in your community. And the, uh, or how many of you, I can't remember how the question was asked, how many of you didn't report, but it was something like 94, 95% of those students who knew of an honor offense did not report it. I mean, that's, that's nearly all of the students who knew of an honor offense didn't report it. And so my point is, has culturally, has it become, in a sense, dishonorable? to uphold the honor system? Has it become sort of a personal strike against you? Oh, I don't want to be a rat. I don't want to make somebody's life miserable. I don't want to be responsible for getting somebody kicked out. We could sit here all day and, and, and excuse it, excuse getting involved. Um, tell me your thoughts on that, that idea that you can show students videos all day long about why the honor system is important, why the, how the committee works, how it's there. That doesn't mean they're going to use it when the time comes when they should. Your thoughts? Anybody? I think one thing that has changed a lot about the university over the decades is it's just gotten a lot bigger. Uh, I mean, it's now, I don't know what the exact number is now, but it's probably close to about 25,000 students. And a lot of students come here without a background in any kind of honor code at their high school. And so the honor system is very foreign to them. And we're still talking about 18 to 22-year-olds for the most part. And I think they're, they're looking for examples of who to follow and not to throw Mike and the faculty under the bus. Um, I think one problem is that a lot of faculty don't support the honor system um, in a very enthusiastic, vocal way. And the one thing that all 25,000 students have in common on grounds is that we all go to class and we all have professors. And especially as a first year student, you're looking to that professor as you know, your cue about what is a university about. And I think a critical thing for the honor system is to get those faculty saying on the very first day of class, the second day of class, the third day of class, the honor system is important here. And I believe in it, I intend to enforce it, and I expect you to enforce it, because that's what we do as a community. Um, and I think if students start to see that example from others, they'll be much more likely to follow it themselves. And that's not to excuse students who don't report. Um, you know, I think I wish all students did report, but I also get that you know, it's a very difficult decision. And it's, it's time consuming, as Charlie kind of alluded to. Sometimes a case can drag on for a year. Um, and you're going to have a fellow student you know, who you're accusing, and of, you're going to be potentially responsible for them being kicked out of school forever. Um, that's a weighty burden, um, and I think the honor, the honor committee and the university needs to figure out how do we you know, put the pieces in place to encourage students to come forward and have the courage to do those things. 
Well, I think you're very fair to put a lot of the burden on the faculty. And so, again, to kind of broaden the perspective here, um, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a cultural shift. I think it's not just amongst the students at UVA. I think it's within society. Uh, and I think we see this in any number of dimensions, this notion of reaching out and, and you know, targeting someone is, is something you don't do. Uh, uh, and it's very true for faculty, it's just as well as it is for students. Uh, it's very true for faculty at all universities, uh, I would say. And I think the barriers in the honor system, because it is a very uh, onerous process, uh, accentuates that. But to just give you one, you know, another anecdote, when I was on the faculty at NYU, it was a new faculty there, junior faculty, had a student who uh, um, blatantly plagiarized on, a, on, a, on, a, on an exam, um, you know, not even doing it well. She actually you know, suddenly switched from the third person to the first person, and I kind of felt, you know, you just copied it off a website, basically. Um, so very clear-cut case. I went to my department chair and said, you know, what, what's the process here? Because I wasn't even aware at the time what the process was at NYU. And her counsel was, oh, don't do anything. Don't, you know, maybe confront the student, but boy, you do not want to get into this, you know, morass of, of dealing with this. Who knows, it might lead to a lawsuit, who, you know, what trouble are you going to get into? You don't want to waste your time. Um, and I think that, that mentality pervades. Uh, uh, and, and I think, again, in a more litigious society, the, op you know, the chances that there could be some type of, you know, uh, legal action is maybe small, but it's still enough to, to you know, be a fear. I think the other challenge that we have is an educational one. Uh, and the Honor Committee and the administration has done a lot to try to educate faculty. And I think here we have a large, large number of faculty who are very, very supportive of the faculty, excuse me, of the, of the Honor System. But uh, it's a constant process of renewal. We hired, I forget how many new faculty this past year, it's in the hundreds. Uh, so each one of them is coming in, often, by the way, from, again, institutions that don't have the same ideals. So they're not used to this type of system. They're used to a very, very different mentality. And they have to be, you know, basically educated about our system and process. The last piece of it, and this is where I think the hardest educational opportunities are for faculty, for those who do go through the process, that usually means that they're pretty confident that someone cheated. And when those students aren't, let's say, kicked out, you can sour a faculty member for the rest of their career. And that could be 20, 30 years of someone who now has said, I'm done with the honor system. Now the fact of the matter is, there are reasons that the protections are there for the students, as you mentioned. And what you might suspect might not be sufficient to motivate a trial to convict. Um, but that's a very different story, to, difficult to a story to tell to a faculty member who's in the moment and has expectations that they really think something happened there. Um, so it, it is a challenge. It's a challenge, again, on multiple levels. New faculty coming in, getting by into the system, getting those to even get involved if they do see something, and then those who do go through the system having a positive experience regardless of the outcome. I, I always try to come back to where I began you know, my comments earlier, which is the mar hallmark of a strong honor system, especially when it comes to academic fraud and cheating, is the amount of that going on. It is not the number of convictions. And that is something very hard sometimes for faculty to understand. It's not the success rate we have of processing it. I will, I'll say it right now. Our system is not very good about processing and convicting cheaters. I know that might be shocking to people. But what's so powerful about our system, what works so well, is I go back to the self-governance piece. We have a system that is restricting the amount of cheating. So again, I will take a system that is poor at convicting cheaters than I will a place where 90% of the cheated students are cheating. Because at the end of the day, there's far more cheating going on at those places, even with a higher conviction rate. But again, that's very hard sometimes for faculty to understand and really embrace about the sacrifice. In some ways, you could say the sacrifices they're making by giving up governance to the students to run a system like ours. Uh, I would say that everything that's been said in response to this question, I think I would agree with here. Um, and add only that. I think the system, while its intent in the trial process and reporting procedures that occur uh, is the pursuit of the truth, um, by nature becomes adversarial um, because you have an accused student who has a lot on the line and they will defend themselves if they think they have not cheated and they'll defend themselves sometimes when they know they've cheated. And so, especially in the case where a student knows they've cheated, and, or lied or stole, and wants to prosecute their own defense or push, put forward their own defense as vociferously as possible, it becomes adversarial. And you pair 
the ratcheting of tensions up with a system that processes cases very slowly uh, because it's run by volunteers uh, who have to coordinate their class schedules, the professor's class schedules, their peers' class schedules, et cetera. And at the center of it all, an accused student who wants to stay at UVA and has every incentive, although I think sometimes they don't think with the long view, to drag the case out, you have a system that is very difficult to get through as a reporter, um, let alone the cultural shifts and the issues of, as a professor, facing that student in class the next day, as a peer sitting next to them, because obviously if you've seen cheating, you're close to that person, um, typically. Uh, and those folks know that this will go on for a long time. It can get ugly, and it's not fun to do. But I think some of that can be fixed procedurally. I think some of it must be acknowledged and perhaps educated uh, amongst the faculty and the students that you know, we know this is a big burden. This is something about coming to the school, and you should self-select to be here in some ways for this. Um, not totally. Um, I don't think you know, we should exalt that we have this disciplinary system, but um, I think it needs to be made more widely known that it is not an easy thing to do, um, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, and you know, I think some in this room probably remember uh, times where there was a non-toleration clause, and that was an honor offense in itself to not report. I think those days are probably over, um, as much as I think that that is perhaps emblematic of a pure system. Um, you know, I think a big thing for the honor system to do, and I think they are doing, is have a clear-eyed look at how things are today, who the students at the school are today, and how to make something work that instills the ideal, you know, and has a procedure that supports it. So before we go to your questions, I want to hear about the Audit Commission. And, and let's have a very frank, candid conversation about fixes, for each from our own perspective. If you could wave a magic wand, what, what needs to happen? And to, to introduce that part of our conversation, Michael, tell us about the commission, where it came from, what you're doing, and what's the status? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, as I'm sure you all appreciate, you know, with age comes perspective. And I think with the students, um, things that are two years old have been around since the time of Jefferson, right, in their, in their mindset. And so one of the joys that I've had and being, I've also sit on the honor faculty committee that they have, and uh, being able to have that perspective to say, wow, you know what, you know, maybe sadly, but some of the same issues you're dealing with, we were dealing with 25 years ago, right? That this isn't a new thing you're dealing with. This is, in fact, you know, these are perpetual issues. Um, so I would give a lot of credit to Matt West, the former honor chair. Uh, he put together the commission. I think it's very important to understand that this commission, this audit commission was put together by the students, by the honor committee. Uh, it's a mix of uh, students, faculty, alumni, administrators within the university uh, ecosystem. Uh, and I think the important thing to recognize is the audit piece of this. This, this is not a uh, critique of the honor system. This is an opportunity to take a step back and collect a lot of data to give us perspective on where we've been and where we are today. Uh, I teach business strategy over at Dart, and one of the things that we obviously emphasize with that is you know, understand your peers, understand your competitors. So one of the things that I've been personally involved with is just simply collecting data on what our peers are doing, to have a really good understanding of how we are the same and how we are different than other institutions, getting to some of those facts on the table that I, I began with. Uh, we're also doing in-depth uh, surveying of different constituencies. You know, what is the current sentiment in the students uh, f uh, f and faculty? And, and fortunately, we have some previous ones that have been done, so we're able to build up kind of an understanding of how maybe sentiments are changing over time. So sharing some of that as well. Uh, we're doing some work digging into the actual statistics of the honor system, you know, the conviction rates, the reporting rates, and the like, and trying to understand, again, trends over time. So I think, you know, the first and foremost, what the Audit Commission is going to do is just put a lot of facts and data on the table so that the students, because I think it's very important, that it's the students who are going to take this and do something with it. Um, we will, I think, raise issues, uh, but I've been at least personally very vocal that I don't think it's the Commission's uh, purpose to make specific recommendations. And I think it's very important, and this goes back to the self-governance piece. Uh, given that it's a committee made up of administrators and faculty in addition to students and alumni, I feel very uncomfortable with us saying, you know, you shall do X, you shall do Y. 
So the, really the goal here is to provide a, a platform for discussion and that we imagine, and the students have already talked about this, that the Honor Committee will take the report, share it with the community, and to begin a series of engagements with the broader student body that might lead to procedural changes or uh, referendum and the like. But we won't be produ uh, proposing anything specific like that ourselves. So, it, it, Stuart, beginning with you, what, wave a magic wand. I mean, what, what needs to, to happen as I began the conversation you know, the committee, the system was created to preserve and strengthen a certain code that I don't think there's a person in this room that wouldn't subscribe to that code as, in, as important values that inform this community. But what needs to happen with that system? What, what should that system be doing that it's not doing? Or what should it, what should it uh, stop doing that it is doing? I mean, I think... <clears throat> I mean, the one side of it is what we've talked about a lot already is kind of the procedural side of almost what's like a criminal justice system where you have a trial and a jury and an investigation that, proceed, that precedes all of that. And I think we can probably all agree that that should be faster um, just to move these cases through, um, not in a way that's irresponsible, but that is fair to the person who reports the case and that's frankly also fair to the student who is accused of an honor offense. Um, I don't think it's a pleasant experience to be under a cloud of suspicion for six months or a year, not knowing whether you're going to be able to stay at, at UVA or not, or, or you're going to have to figure out how to transfer, and are all the classes that I'm taking right now going to transfer? Am I going to get those credits, or am I going to have to repeat a year of school somewhere else? Um, so I think if we could figure out a way to, to speed things up, that would be great. But with all of this, there is this tension because... The system is student run and students have you know, a job here and their first job here is to go to class and write papers and take exams and working for the honor committee is sometimes like a full time job. I'm sure you know, when Charlie, Charlie and I were in law school together and Charlie would put in 40 hour weeks as the honor chair you know, in addition to what he was doing as a law student. Um, so it's, it's a huge commitment uh, and I think sometimes we kind of forget that you know, these are just students doing it. And if we want it to be, you know, a more efficient system, we could hand it over to administrators. You could hire people who would do this as their full-time job. But I think we would lose what the system is really about, which is letting students figure it out. And, and part of it is that this is an educational opportunity for the students. Um, you know, part of college is learning how to be an adult. And you don't necessarily do that in the classroom, but you learn how to do that when you're making decisions about whether your peer has committed an honor offense or when you're making decisions about you know, how should we punish people? Should we have a single sanction? Should we have another system? Um, and people are going to make mistakes. That's what anybody does. But the honor system is bigger and stronger than any one class of students. Um, and critically, we have administrators here who are willing to let the students be in charge and make those mistakes. And I think you can talk to some of those administrators, and they will tell you that other schools don't do it like this. They do not give a bunch of 18 to 22-year-olds authority to kick other students out of school without any direct oversight, without any kind of escape hatch for the administration to say, no, we're going to overrule that decision. Um, that just doesn't happen at universities anymore, especially at big ones. Um, and so we, there's a, a, a really important commitment there. Um, i trying to think what else I would wave my magic wand for. Um, you know, I think it's, as UVA has grown, it's just gotten harder to communicate with every class of incoming students. But I, I wish there were better ways to get the message of honor across to first-year students in particular. You know, one of the great advantages of a university is that every four years, you have a complete turnover of the undergraduate population. So you kind of have a chance to, to change values and the culture pretty rapidly just because the population moves through so quickly. Um, and I think you know, if we can figure out ways to target first years, especially when they first step foot on grounds, and I think our most kind of impressionable, um, that would be very helpful to you know, passing on the, the real virtues of honor. Um, putting aside kind of the, the procedural aspects of it. And Michael, I know you're speaking not as the chair of the audit commission here, <laughs> right. but as a... I'm not the chair of the audit commission, just right. a member. Uh, you know, yeah, the yeah. audit commission, yeah. yeah. 
Well, um, uh, I agree with everything that was just said. Uh, I think there's a lot that can always be done to kind of improve the system and, and, and the like. To add something different, um, and again, I'm speaking, this is only the perspective of, of Mike, not as the university here. Um, I, I think there's some really interesting opportunities to have conversations about the code as opposed to the system. And by the code, I'm in particular thinking about scope. So there was some interesting you know, uh, uh, discussions uh, around the whole, uh, many of the discussions around the Rolling Stone case from a few years ago. But one of them that I thought was interesting relative to honor was why isn't sexual assault an honor offense? Now that's a hairy issue and I don't want to dive into that one right now. But the, the broader question of well, what, what is honor and what does it mean to be honorable at the university is a great conversation to have and great ones for the students to grapple with. Um, and we've locked into lying, cheating, and stealing, but as, as Coy can attest, that there's, that's not always been the case. There's a historical you know, evolution of the system. I think it would be healthy for us to have a, a, just a, a broader discussion of what does it mean to be honorable at the university. And maybe it extends beyond the system, right? Let's not worry so much about the system of are we achieving the broader objectives of an honorable community. I, I would love to see that conversation be more robust. The magic wand question is tough, um, but I think a way to think about it is there are a number of stakeholders in the honor system, faculty members, students who have cheated, students who see cheating, students who don't see cheating. And I think maybe two key seats to think about where you might sit uh, is one, you've made a grave error and cheated, lied, or stole. And what system do you want in that case. And you have to, at that point, also maybe layer in a bit of honesty on the back end and say, what system do you want that preserves an honorable community in that case that you've cheated? And one, I think, in that seat, I want something that potentially gives me a second chance, whether that chance is the conscientious retraction, which is before you're, before you're suspected, you can turn yourself in, or if it's the informed retraction, which is this in short, a plea bargain, you know, you have been found out and you can turn yourself in, um, is one for debate. Uh, I tend to go for the conscientious retraction only, but what system do you want as someone who's made this mistake? And I think there have to be potential outs. It has to be something that lets you put on, whether it's a defense or your story, is kind of a question of philosophy. I think something that allows you to, to explain yourself to whomever is going to judge you is important, allow you to prepare for that, and then allow you to tell the most fulsome version of the facts as you see them is, are the key kind of pillars there in, in being in the hot seat of having committed an honor offense. And then as a reporter, what do you have at stake? Well, you, know, you don't want something that's incredibly vicious or awful to deal with that keeps you up at night and cold sweats. You don't want something that drags on for a long, long time. Um, and you don't want something that's unfair to the student who's been reported. I think both sides in this want to be you know, fully heard. Um, and both, well, I think the, the faculty members and the students who report also want to make sure that the student who is reported uh, has, has their chance to tell their story. And my magic wand, I think, takes out a lot of the process and the layers that exist now. I don't think we need to have a mini judiciary system um, with you know, prosecutors and defense attorneys running around trying to spin the facts the best way they can. This is I think, a lawyer saying this. yeah. <laughs> um, I think you need something where a student has help presenting their case if they need it. A faculty member or a student reporter has help, or a community reporter even too has help presenting their case if they need it. Before a neutral body that is not the same group of people every time. I think that's a key tenet of of a jury system is that it cycles through with, with new voices and is small d democratic um, in that way. Uh, and something that takes maybe a month, um, that gives people time to collect their thoughts, let you know emotions and tempers come down a bit, and then facts are presented, decision is made. If there's a mistake, there's an opportunity for appeal. But right now we've got investigations and you know essentially lawyers running around that are not trained lawyers and don't have time to be lawyers because they're students um, trying to win cases. And that's, that's not really where I think we came from. Um, and so my magic wand takes the adversarialness out of it as much as possible. 
and is fair to the two most important stakeholders in the whole process, which is the person who has been reported and the person who filed the report. Um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to make change, and uh, touching on what Stuart said about student culture earlier, you know, you do not have a uniform body of students, and that's a very, very good thing for the University of Virginia. But when it comes to an honor system, and the fact that, you know, students cycle in and out of here every four years, uh, it's very difficult to build, I think, a uniform consensus among the students that own the system, and you kind of pinball around trying to make changes. Um, and so that's where I think the commission comes in, and they do some of the heavy lifting of the fact gathering and, you know, some of the analysis of those facts that will enable students to make a good change, I hope. Good stuff. So let's go to the questions. I'm going to move over to this mic, and just by a show of hands, here you go. Just by a show of hands, uh, Chauncey's right here in the aisle, and then we'll call on you. A mic will find you if you could keep your remarks or questions as brief as possible so we can get to as many people as possible. We'd all appreciate it. Thank you very much. You, you've been emphasizing uh, uh, cheating just about the whole time. I have an article here that was in the Daily Progress two or three years ago. It says, Jonathan Perkins was a week from graduation when the scandal broke. He had claimed in a letter to the editor of the law school's newspaper that UVA had mistreated him after stopping him in March. UVA News release later announced that he had admitted, admitted it to inventing the alleged misconduct to bring attention to the issue of police misconduct. There's a picture of him here. He's African-American. And then go on down, it says here, um, he, he says he missed graduation from the pending article, but was acquitted over the summer by a jury of fellow students, according to UVA Law School Dean Mahoney. Why wasn't he convicted? He admitted he did it. I don't understand this. I really, my, my, my uh, the honor system just went down the pot when I saw that. This was uh, just a few years ago. This was 2011. Played. 2011, uh, it was, and you know the specifics of the case, Charlie. Go ahead. I was I was not the honor chairman at that time. My successor had taken over, so I think I can talk about this safely. Um, but the answer I'm going to give you is not going to be a satisfying one, and I just will get that out there up front. <laughs> no, and that I mean I I'll, I'll go into to what I think the answer answer is here, and or and in a general sense, um, the purpose of the process we have is to get the facts out. And it's confidential at the, student, the accused student's election for good reason. Um, to preserve reputations, to you know, allow for a hearing that won't get out to, to the entire student body unless that student elects to, to have that occur. And while he admitted that he lied in the paper, there were clearly more facts at play. I don't know what they were, but what I do trust is the students that were on that jury, uh, I know they deliberated for, I'm sure, hours. Uh, they heard all sides of the case, and they made a decision on two dimensions. One, did the act occur? Did this person lie? And then two, and this is the much more subjective dimension, you know, what do we think as a student jury about the toleration of this act? And I didn't hear the arguments. I don't know what uh, this student or his, his counsel said as to why this might be something that could be tolerated. But I, I'm going to guess that that's where this, this came down. On the second dimension of the honor jury vote, you need nearly unanimous vote that this isn't to be tolerated around the University of Virginia. And it's a very personal judgment, um, but one that I, I, you have to, if you're going to have this system, trust the jury to make. And very frustrating. And I read that in the newspaper and was inflamed. Um, and <laughs> I called the Honor Committee office to report Jonathan Perkins, and it had already been done. Um, so, you know, I'm not sitting here to say that I'm not frustrated in a way that you are, but I also have to, you know, divorce myself from that frustration and say we have a system that trusts neutral fellow students to do this, and, and i gotta got to accept their results. And, and I don't think it was an issue of pure 
race or anything like that. It, it, it is something about the facts in this case that we just don't know that led them to that result. Yeah. Um, right here. Can I add one thing? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Stuart. Sorry. And one other thing, and, and Charlie touched on this, and this also goes back to the magic wand question, but I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that to be convicted of an honor offense, it's not enough just to, to be found that you, you cheated or you lied. There are three elements. There's the act, there's the intent, and then the, the other one Charlie was talking about was called seriousness when I was a student. I don't know if it's still seriousness or not, but there's this, this third element that what you did has to be serious enough that it, the community of trust can't tolerate it. And you know, I don't know the exact history of when this element came about, but there's this, this tension in the honor system because we have the single sanction, which in principle, you know, I think says, no act of lying, cheating, or stealing is too small. That if you, do, if you commit any act of lying, cheating, or stealing, we don't want you, you're not a part of this community. But then you also have, you know, but that involves a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a big punishment. And the system, and part of the reason there is this big bureaucracy around it is because of the single sanction, because we want to protect students and make sure they're not kicked out of school if they haven't actually done anything. And the seriousness element is one of the big protections, but it also creates this tension because it says, well, you can cheat or you can lie or you can steal, but if a jury of your peers finds that it's a, a not serious act of lying, cheating, or stealing, then you can stay. But the single sanction suggests there's no such thing as a non-serious act. Um, and so I think that's a conversation that needs to happen in a very robust, kind of, you know, just thoughtful way of you know, how do we reconcile these things? And are there, are there ways to, you know, create a better system that doesn't have that tension. And I, I agree with Charlie, I think that's most likely where that jury came out as they decided this was a non-serious act of lying. And you know, I disagree with that, it sounds like Charlie does too, but that's, that's the system we have right now and I think it, it prompts, it's a good prompt for a conversation about what should this system look like going forward. And is that one of the biggest challenges facing facing the system today is this idea that, that built in is this toleration clause that, well, if, if we at this culturally don't think it's that big of a deal, then you can stay, even though you're guilty. I, you know, I would put out there, first of all, it's at least 30 years old. If, and I, I don't know, Corey, you know when the, the, what we used to call the seriousness clause came about. I don't. Um, my experience, again, I'm very dated, so it was 25 years ago, is that that doesn't come up as often as people think. It might have been, I have no, nothing about this case, so it might have been this case, but um, I think that's also something like the faculty think as well, that you know, this, this is gonna kill every case. Is this, in my, again, limited, very dated experience that it doesn't come up as often as, you know, as people know. probably think. But again, we'd have to back that up yeah. with data. Good to know, we're right here. Yes, sir. The uh, rumor on the street yesterday was that grade inflation is rampant here, that there are, you're, public grade and your private grade, um, which I find appalling. But in line with that, wouldn't it disincentivize cheating to just make grading pass or fail so that you're not trying to go from a 3.2 to a 3.8 by cheating on, uh, on an exam or, or a paper? Uh, you know, it was a great privilege to be here 50 years ago and take your blue book down to the Cavalier and write your exam in the Cavalier having a beer. I mean, that was fantastic. I could leave my jacket and book books in a hallway for a week and they would be there when I got back. That, that, that's, that's desirable in a society. But this whole business, I mean, is anybody really seriously thought about the, doing pass or fail to, to, to keep people from wanting to cheat because yeah. it's going to give them an edge? It's a great point, Mike. Is that so as a faculty member, I would love that. I would totally endorse <laughs> that. It would make my life a lot easier not to have to, to deal with that, the grading component. Like, um, With that said, uh, again, from a limited sample of my experience over the years, I'm not as convinced that it's... It, it, it falls in the way we think it does in terms of what motivates people to cheat. 
Um, I have seen students who are straight A students who are upset about an A minus fall to the dark side. And there are students at risk of failing who are like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, say la vie, right? So that was your category. <laughs> you know, the gentleman C is, uh, is, you know, is, is appealing to many people. So it, 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 it's interesting how it manifests itself. And I'm not sure if, you know, making a pass fail, maybe it, it limits some of that, but uh, there might be some of that still somehow in there. There's other honors to be had and other things that people are gunning for, maybe a scholarship or a recognition that, that, that provides an incentive. Um, so uh, it's an interesting idea, but I don't know if it would it, you know, totally solve the problem. Um, but I think you know, the, the broader point about uh, some of these anemones, or excuse me, um, uh, benefits you get from the honor system, many of them are still here. At, at Darden, all of, our, all of our final exams are, are take home. Um, and students do them wherever they'd like, so they can go to the bar and, and take their exam. Uh, it's all electronic now, sorry. We don't do the blue books anymore, but it's, you know, take your laptop and go wherever and, and take the final exam. So you, you do see a lot of those elements we talk about still present here. Uh, the stealing one, I, I struggle a little bit. I have a 12-year-old daughter, and, you know, as a proud father, you know, there's recommendations you make in the idealistic sense, and then there's recommendations you'd make of someone living in the real world. And, and the, I think at the university, I would be appalled if any university person would steal, but there are other people walking around the university, right? So there, there are challenges there when you tell people, yeah, just leave your laptop on the lawn for a few days. Well, you know, I don't know if I'd give that recommendation to anybody. Um, I would be, you know, livid if it was, you know, a student or someone else in the community who, who would actually take something, but it, there's other people around. Um, so there, there are those normal challenges on some of these elements. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, right there. Hi. Thank you. Um, as a double who and a longtime faculty member, I really appreciate all that you do uh, to maintain a community of trust. It's a wonderful system, and uh, I'm very proud to be a part of it. Uh, my question is a little bit more challenging because in participating with the honor committee uh, sessions and everything over the years, uh, I'm increasingly concerned about how certain segments of our university community may be disadvantaged in the honor system and how people from racial and ethnic minorities are in fact more targeted, more vulnerable to accusations and then may suffer a higher conviction rate in comparison to the white male counterparts at this university. And I'm curious to know what is the vision for the future about how to address what may be implicit bias within the system um, related to upholding our honor community. Mike, I'm curious if the, if the audit commission is finding that numbers perhaps might bear that out. Uh, I don't know. I don't know at this point. Um, uh, so this is one of these thorny issues that's been around for a long time. Uh, the year before I assumed uh, the honor chair, uh, there was a report written that would kind of highlighted the spotlighting effect, as we called it. Um, and so that was a very influential report, again, written over 25 years ago. Um, when I was honor chair, we had a very public open trial where an African-American student was dismissed that led to a lot of concerns and reflections on this issue. So this is not um, something new. Um, and uh, it's, it's a problem that we haven't addressed yet. So how do we best address it? I'm open to you know, suggestions, and I'm sure the committee is as well, but it obviously is one that's deeper and systematic than it is just the honor system it, itself here, uh, and how we deal with that. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to just punt, but it's, I think we're all struggling with how, we, how to deal with that issue. I, I'd also, I don't want to, challenge your question, because that's not my intent. Um, but recognize in that question that the students who make up the juries and the students that administer the system and the faculty members that assist those students in administering the system and the students that inhabit the school on the large part, you know, live in a very diverse multicultural society that I think is conditioning people to have less and less implicit bias and, you know, it concerns me to have this question raised because if, if it's perceived that there's bias, then you've got a problem already. But I've never seen an instance of explicit bias, and I think the numbers are so few that it's difficult, in, at least in the scheme of a student administering a system in their years here, to know if there is any implicit bias. Um, I think that people often shoot this question out 
and I just don't, I, and I hope the commission maybe has numbers on this at some point, um, to know whether they, they think that it actually exists. And, and you know, the spotlight report exists, but I think things change and can change quickly um, in this dimension. And I think that there has to be an element of trust uh, for the students and, and the folks who, who are here. Just add. Yeah, Stuart. I mean, my knowledge is a little dated, but I mean, the data that I remember always showed that there were problems with cases being reported to the Honor Committee and who was being reported, but that within the system, um, there, was no, there were no disparities. Once someone was in the system, everyone was treated equally. But there's still the very major problem of people who are coming into the system are not necessarily representative of the system. And I, I hate to put him on the spot, but we actually have the current honor chair over here, Devin. And I don't know if Devin. Hey, yeah. Devin, hang on a sec, Devin. Get him away from Mike to get you. Hi guys, I'm Devin Rosine, the current uh, honor chair. So as uh, Stuart actually brought up, a little bit awkward, but. <laughs> uh, so there is a problem of disproportionate reporting. You're absolutely right. Uh, what I can speak to within the system, support officers are currently trained uh, with implicit bias modules. They're trained to be uh, cognizant of the different representative groups at the university. Personally, uh, that's just straight on the issue. Uh, there is disproportionate reporting of certain groups. The major problem that we're having right now is with international students, which is a twofold kind of issue. One, uh, are they more likely to cheat because they come from a different culture, but also the issue of different professors possibly having a implicit bias towards different groups of students. But what I can say is that once they are brought into the system, they are treated equally. Um, something that we can also note is that um, there's only three, there's, in the past year, there are only three students who were expelled from the university or dismissed, uh, found guilty of an honor offense. From that, it's really difficult to try to grapple with any sort of um, demographic data because you're dealing with such a small subset of a university community. Uh, out of the 49 cases that we got, uh, there were disproportionate rates with both of those. But we are working toward trying to help out with that. And a lot of what I'm doing with, over, with faculty over the summer will try to address that. But thanks so much. Thank you. Devin, thank you very much. Next question is right back here. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm so glad to hear your comments, young man, because it relates to the question that I had. And it has to do with the orientation of the young students that first arrive at EVA, that they're entering into a, maybe a different world than they've ever been in before where there's an honor system. You don't know the background of that student, if they ever had any good role models in their life. And when we go back to what Thomas Jefferson described this place as being an incubator, this is like the safety net. This is like the last stop before they enter out there into the world as an adult. And this is the opportunity for them to develop maybe a piece of their character that has not been formed yet. So if the young students entering into UVA are in their orientation actually hear a testimonial by someone whose life was literally turned around because they had the chance to learn a hard lesson here before they got out there in that tough world, that it could make a huge difference. And to say that you don't want to kick that young chick out of the incubator before it's fully formed, but to take seriously how the accountability, mentoring, or whatever needs to take place because that might be the only chance that that student ever will have again. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is that opportunity, not a scary thing that I better watch my step, but for them to know that if a fellow student does turn them in, it's an act of caring because this is gonna give them a chance. Thank you very much, it's a terrific point. Can you talk to the issue of the, the orientation and the role that it plays in the larger system and how maybe that, has, that orientation has changed over the years? Because I know from my historical research, back many, many decades, the, the part of that matriculation process as a new student has, for a long time, has always involved a discussion and an introduction to that system and the idea of honor at Virginia. It's always been there, a really critical part of the, the system. Uh, I think there are elements of orientation now, and I don't, I'm sp speaking now, let's say five years ago now, when I was the chairman, um, that you would all recognize. You know, a, a, a convocation speech and the signing of the pledge and getting, uh, I don't know if we had green books back then, but you know, getting some paperwork and some writings about how this glorious honor system exists and what it means to be a UVA student. 
And that is very similar to, to probably what's gone on for decades. Um, but there is an acute need for, and there, that need is being filled in, in steps and stages as we get smarter about orienting students to this uh, for a practical education in what this honor system means. Um, I remember uh, anecdotally uh, a time where I sat with students who had a Chinese language student newspaper here on grounds. And we talked about the honor system and why it was challenging, especially for international students from China. And they said, well, the character you use uh, in a direct translation for honor really is linked more to the word deference. And so what is an honor system? Is a deference system? You just do what the teacher says. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. It's more about trust. And I'm like, oh, well, that's a different character. You should be using that uh, when you talk about the honor system. And that was a kind of an aha moment. You know, Words have different meanings. Translations have different shadings to meanings. And it's very sometimes nuanced and, and sometimes historically different. Um, and the convocation speech and the signing of the pledge and the English word you know, is not necessarily the same for every person in their understanding. And so that's why you know, we have for years had you know, dorm talks where you go through scenarios and explain, you know, Joe sees Jane copying another person's answers. Is this cheating? What do you think, et cetera? Um, and even then, though, that may not be enough. Um, that may need to be tailored for, uh, you know, and we, we started to do this in my years here uh, for special situations that athletes might face. And so we rolled out a system where the, <laughs> the, the scenarios were a little more complicated and a little more attuned to the specific groups that we were presenting them to. And so, you know, instead of saying Josie's Jane cheat on a test, it's, you know, Jane and Mary come back from their basketball game and it's 1030 at night and they haven't completed their assignments and, you know, they're both in the same class, you know, what do you do? And talk through more complicated, more relevant issues, um, whether that's to a student athlete, to somebody from uh, high school that didn't have an honor system, from somebody, you know, from overseas that, that really is coming, you know, to an entirely alien environment with this thing that's even distinctive in the United States. I mean, we have to account for that. It's just difficult to do. And so it'll occur in stages and has occurred in stages. And I imagine, you know, is, is, is something that is ongoing today. Lee. Thank you. I'm uh, Lee Middleditch. I'm a local <coughs> who went to undergraduate in the 40s and law school in the 50s. And I've lived here ever since. And I think I've seen a lot regarding the evolutionary evolution of the honor system. And I'd like to make just some myopic observations. <clears throat> Picking up uh, how large the university is now, as an undergraduate, it was probably a third of the size. There were very few women, no blacks. The student body was basically homogenous, so it was easier to deal with that group than it is with the very large and diverse uh, population that you have now. With respect to the uh, student mores, it's always intrigued me because I can remember when Frank Hereford was the president during the Vietnam War, there were no convictions in the honor system because anybody that was kicked out was on his way to Vietnam. And Frank had to get the honor uh, committee uh, together as the war Wound, wound down and said, you've got to take a strain on this, otherwise we'll have no honor system whatsoever in the future. I'd like to address uh, briefly the single sanction, which I think is really at the heart of the student concern nowadays. And you have all of these qualifiers that avoid having to address the single sanction, um, conscientious retraction being one, there are psychiatric aspects that could <laughs> absolve you of an honor offense now. <clears throat> when I was in uh, law school, Tardy Dillard was the dean, and he uh, was on the investigative committee for both West Point and the Air Force Academy when they had a cheating scandals there. And he was reported to have said, following those two investigations, that no honor system that he had ever observed, and he was a West Point graduate himself, <clears throat> was worthwhile if it didn't have a single sanction, if there wasn't some sort of draconian result for, of the penalty. 
another myopic observation is that if you take the children that are coming, or young people coming out of high school, age 18 to 22, plagiarism is not generally an aspect that they understand. And we had a plagiarism scandal involving a physics professor who had multiple choice tests and uh, he got involved in a software program that analyzed the uh, res responses and determined that there were uh, a number of cheating students who had cheated on this examination and that proved to be a cause celeb. On the other hand, if you take the student mores as an example, then my era, now, uh, you can't uh, imagine that a student would be held to be uh, cheating or lying if he had a false ID to get liquor at the ABC store. That's just outside of the realm of, a, of an offense that the students feel responsible for. I have, my final comment is for Charlie, I think, because I've pinged on him before. He can't remember this. But I've tried to get the chairs of the honor commission committees for the past several years to consider putting up to the student body a vote. And the vote would be to change the constitution of the honor system by removing one phrase. It currently reads, if you're convicted of an honor offense, you shall be permanently expelled from the university. I would like to see the student body vote on whether eliminating that word permanently might be worthwhile. So there'd be some sort of opportunity for redemption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, that's terrific. Did you have a question? We got time for one more, and I want to give you an hour. And we have one. We'll do two back there. Yep, right there. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, actually, my question is more pertaining to Stuart, I think, in the sense that I'm curious about the, the dialogue that you may have had with your father. Um, who was on the honor committee when I was at school here, um, and uh, and and the the sense of actually the simplicity of the system that we had at the time, um, and and I'm I'm actually kind of surprised to hear I haven't been keeping up and I didn't know the all of the um, changes that have taken place over the years, um, and uh, and to hear the the faculty advisors and the the juries and. Uh, all, all, all of that's, that's changed. I, I just wonder about the notion of the simplicity of the system that we had, which is, was really basically, you know, it was all the I, I can understand that the presidents of the schools, um, uh, where, which I was one, uh, had, had to sit on juries. I think we had 12 over the, the year I was on the honor committee. Um, and so there weren't, that, there, were, there weren't that many, but it was a lot of time. Um, but, uh, but the idea of, um, of the offense, uh, and the intent. I think those were the two aspects that, and the, the third did not uh, did not come up. There were no degrees of honor, um, and uh, and so I'm and, and and the single sanction. I, I would agree with what was just said. I think was really really an important aspect. But I'm curious about if you've had that conversation with your father, and and uh, and how it how it may have gone, and and the sort of the sense of is it is it better to have a simpler system than what apparently has become quite a bureaucratic situation? Okay. Terrific question. Thank you. Sure. My, my dad and I have certainly talked about it many times. Um, you know, I think there are certain things that my dad sees that are very similar. You know, he, would, he remembers trials in Newcomb Hall on the weekends, you know, spending a Saturday or Sunday at an honor trial, having to hear from an accused student and deciding whether to kick them out. And you know, that still happens today. The honor committee has its trials on Saturdays or Sundays in Newcomb Hall, and uh, we're still up in the trial room. There a lot of things that you know, he didn't really get. Um, and he hadn't, you know, until I was a student and my sister was a student, he hadn't really followed how things had changed. He knew there was still the single sanction and that you know, he kind of understood that the honor system was still very important to the student experience. But he didn't realize that it had grown um, in terms of kind of the adjudicative side of it as much. Um, and I think he was, he was surprised by that. My dad's a lawyer, so he kind of gets it um, that, you know, society's become a lot more litigious. The university's probably a little more, you know, risk averse. And some of that leads to, you know, more procedures, more due process. You know, the honor committee has a legal advisor. Um, there's a person, we have a lawyer, I, th I think they still have it, but, you know, on retainer to kind of just provide advice because the honor committee and the university has been sued by students relating to, you know, honor offenses. 
Um, and I think, you know, my dad and I don't always see eye to eye on these things, and he still really strongly believes in the single sanction. Um, I've become a little more ambivalent on it. I think it can sometimes be a distraction about, you know, what should the honor system really be focused about? What should the conversation be about? Because at the end of the day, the honor, you know, honor is a very aspirational idea. It's not about punishing people and telling them what not to do. It's about teaching them what to do um, and how to, how to act in your life. And, you know, on that, my dad and I see perfectly eye to eye. Um, and he's, you know, I think also come around to the idea that you know, it's not his anymore. You know, he had his, his years here, and, you know, he was the honor chairman as president of the college, and he still likes to keep informed, but it belongs to the students. And, you know, he will provide advice, um, but that's all he can do. He can't make the decisions anymore. And at the end of the day, he just wants to make sure that there is an honor system um, and that students still care about it. And it may take a different form than what he remembers and what he thinks is best, but as, if that's what students want and that's what keeps honor front and center at the university, then that's a success. Yeah. We'll do one more quick question and then we'll wrap up because I want to keep you all on, uh, on schedule. Okay. A comment. This has been incredible. Is the mic on? Let me make sure that mic is on first. Hold it right to your, like right on your okay. chin. I'm, I'm struck by your exposure to all the different places, universities, or whatever, and you characterized MIT. Yeah, hold it up. MIT with these people that view themselves as clever to beat the system. And that I know in coming here, it was sort of, I didn't feel intimidated because I grew up in a pretty simple environment. I wasn't right, right. fighting for things. And we also knew that things were not perfect. I play golf. You internalize the rules rather than waiting for an external. Right, right. And so the, so the point is, I guess, is I think we've got a, a, a great system here, even as it's evolved, because you knew that the fraternities had old papers. I mean, like yeah, say, yeah. not perfect. What do you, what sort of students are they attracting at, at, MI, at, at MIT? MIT? I mean, what, what is going on? <laughs> no, Stay I, with us just for a couple yeah, of minutes. Yeah, I, I, I think it goes, it is cultural. I, so I don't think our students are any different. Um, and I actually, um, maybe to disagree with our panelists here, I, I try not to buy into the narrative that the students are all different today. Uh, that, that was said about when I joined. It was said about in the 70s when women joined. I mean, every, every generation has a new, expansive set of people that are brought into the university. That's our history. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, so I, I'm trying to be very cautious with the narrative of, you know, the students are different today. Um, and every generation is the same also, right? You know, the next generation, your generation is always great compared to the ones that come after you. Um, we were honorable, those kids today. Oh, they're terrible. I, I think it's organizational, it's cultural. Now, I do agree that as the size and the scope of the university has expanded, keeping cultural norms solid is hard just because of scale. And I think that's some of the struggle that UVA has when it comes around honor is the scale, not the diversity of the, of the student body. Um, but it gets back to those cultural norms. Um, you know, I'll just make a quick comment on the single sanction. You know, these, these referendum come up periodically. They've been coming up, you know, on a more regular basis in recent years. And, and the counsel I always give the students with it is, remember, you are not voting against the single sanction. You're actually voting for something else, whatever that alternative may be. And I want you to be very clear, if you're voting for an alternative, what problem are you trying to solve? So one problem you constantly hear is this lack of reporting. Well, I know, again, I'm an economist. I want to see the data because I can at least know the data I've seen at other schools is that those schools have multiple sanction systems, if no sanction system at all, and they have the same exact problem. Faculty don't report cases there. Students don't report cases there. So the last thing we'd want to do is make drastic changes to the system without fully understanding what's the problem we're trying to solve and what's the implication of the change we're trying to make. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, again, that's the conversation we need to have. But I totally support the notion that the honor system needs to evolve. Uh, I, I think it has evolved, as Coy has kind of you know, well uh, outlined the history here. And so it does need to reflect the current student body and the current student body sentiment. 
Um, but you've got to improve it. And what are the ways that you're actually improving it? Give me 60 seconds here to wrap up really quick. Um, one takeaway I want to leave with you is that, you know, we often see, or I shouldn't say often, but we'll see in the headlines when the honor system fails, you know, 400 students caught handing in the same paper. I mean, athletes caught stealing clothes at Fashion Square Mall. I've read these headlines over the years. It happens, and it always makes the headlines. And I want you to think about this. What never, ever makes the paper, and Michael made this point earlier, are the thousands, tens of thousands of times every school year when the honor system works absolutely perfectly just as it was designed to work. She takes that test, she signs her name, she didn't cheat, and you know what? She didn't cheat. And she didn't cheat because she knew she was gonna sign her name on that pledge. He takes his, does his paper, he doesn't cheat, he doesn't do anything wrong with it, he signs his pledge, and it is, it works perfectly as it was designed with tremendous sincere buy-in on the part of thousands of students here every year, tens of thousands of times, and that will never make the paper. Just think about that. I want to thank the Office of Engagement, our hosts here at Alumni Hall, an amazing team that puts together these reunions. Y'all have a wonderful, safe weekend. Enjoy yourselves here in Charlottesville, and Join me in thanking the members of the panel who came here today for this. Thank you so much. And, and just quickly, just quickly.